are are we ready? I believe so. Yes. Okay. Go for it. I forgot my notes uh, because I put them with my Ferris Bueller socks. I also forgot my notes, and someone sent me a photograph of them. That's you are doing. so lucky. I don't have anyone to do that for me, but I figure one day I'll you'll make remember. friends. <laughs> <laughs> one day, one can only hope. You'll start a family. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the most excellent 80s movies podcast. It's the podcast where a filmmaker and two comedians take time to stop and look around at the 80s movies we love and love to hate with 2019 eyes, a haze of nostalgia, and enough time to do just a heck of a lot of things in one day. (laughs) Yeah. This is Ferris Bueller's Day Off, a movie selection from 1986. I said it before and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. What is so dangerous about a character like Ferris Bueller is he gives good kids bad ideas. Why should he get to skip school when everybody else has to go? Syphilitic meningitis. He never gets caught. This guy in my biology class said that if Ferris dies, he's giving his eyes to Stevie Wonder. Well, he's very popular, he had. I recall Central Park in fall. Ferris Bueller, do you know him? Yeah, he's getting me out of summer school. They think he's a righteous dude. Think he'll be alive this weekend? I can see him denying popular beliefs, setting off on some impossible mission. He jeopardizes my ability to effectively govern this student body. He does whatever he wants. You know, as long as I've known him, everything works for him. Whenever he wants. He's very cool. And he never gets nailed. Ferris can do anything. Oh, he's such a sweet. Wake up and smell the coffee, Mrs. Bueller. It's a fool's paradise. He is just leading you down the primrose path. Matthew Broderick. Bueller. Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller's day off. Because life is too beautiful a thing to waste. It's the story of a sociopath and his best friend. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so uh, our guest today is uh, uh, NCT improv comedian Daniel Frasco. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. So we're very excited to have you because you were born in the year 2000. 1999. Oh, okay. Ooh, yes, in the, in the I'm 90s. so much older. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you've never seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Not until last night, no. I can't wait to hear what your, <laughs> what your perspective on this movie uh, will be. But first, of course, filmmaker Nathan Blackwell is here. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> or good afternoon morning, yes. if you're in another time zone. <laughs> um. What is your history with Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Mine? Um, So it it was always one of those classics. It was never like one of my go-to movies that was in rotation, but it was like one of those classics that was always on TV, and as soon as it comes on, you had to watch at least half of it, you know? And yeah, I'd probably seen it like three, four, five, six times just just on TV, you know? But it it was always... I was always a fan of... um, John Hughes movies, but I really liked the, um, I'd say the, the lighter ones like this more than gravitating towards like the heavier ones, you know, like breakfast club or what yeah, I'd say breakfast club. I that, that would maybe be in the middle. Maybe it's more of the, um, not so much in like in the weird science zone, more mm-hmm. of the planes, trains and automobiles and Ferris Bueller zone. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, I, I always enjoyed it, and it was always kind of a cl- uh, like an '80s classic to me. Yes, I think that it definitely is. Like you could put this in a time capsule and be like, "The 1980s. This is like a a nice, this, a slice of the nice part of it." Mm-hmm. In in like in that specific genre, um, I always forget this is a John Hughes movie. Yeah, yeah, because you you think of like John Hughes, and you think of these. Far more personal movies like The Breakfast Club, mm-hmm. you know, um, that have a little... Pretty in Pink, Sixteen Candles. Right, right. Um, and, yeah, this is... I, I feel like this is kind of a little more of his fun unleashed. Mm-hmm. And have you seen any of the John Hughes oeuvre, or the, is it all new to you? Uh, I saw... I've seen half of a breakfast... Of a... No, I've of seen a, half of Breakfast Club. Okay. The Breakfast Club. And uh, I was very uncomfortable, so I stopped watching it. And so I, 
I don't have much John Hughes experience, but I'm <laughs> eager to learn. You've seen Home Alone, though, I'm guessing. Yes. Is that a John Hughes movie? It is. Yeah, really? he wrote it. Right? Yeah, he yeah. wrote it. But it, in this movie, I was sort of struck by how, like, Ferris Bueller seems like a grown-up Kevin McAllister. Mm-hmm. Like, even, yeah. like, the messing around in the shower with the mohawk <laughs> mm-hmm. bit. Uh-huh. Or when the principal was, like, trying to break into the house. Oh, yeah. That yes. felt very Home Alone to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And because he did have, sort of have a very Rube Goldbergian bedroom with lots of like contraptions and yeah yeah things on levers and pulleys uh what is your like initial impression of the movie like overall i enjoyed it i i liked it more than i thought that i was going to i didn't think i was going to dislike it but i i did enjoy it i thought that it was um i didn't think it would be able to be made today just Mm -hmm. with the gimmickiness of the technology that was being used like phones don't work like that anymore right and answering machines can't be changed (laughs) right (laughs) like immediately yeah right Uh, but i did enjoy it and i see why people liked it so much growing up what do you think of ferris as a character oh i didn't like him he's not not a likable person (laughs) no it's very difficult to root for him it is and yet like that's the that is the entire plot of the movie yeah it's it's weird because he's a trickster but he does kind of manipulate all of his friends to kind of get what he wants that freedom yeah, they're kind of living in the moment. Mm-hmm. And so, like Ferris's best friend Cameron is the his his exact opposite. Yeah, so we we've got Ferris who kind of embodies like the free living and no restrictions and that living in the moment. Mm-hmm. And and then Cameron is the embodiment of like anxiousness, anxiety, depression over worrying and and all that stuff yeah and then we've got also um uh edward rooney the principal who's kind yes. of the embodiment of like order and and control and so you have kind of like these three powerful forces all kind of like you know taking different um positions of power in in these scenes yeah it's like chaotic good chaotic neutral I would say, say I would say he had a good because he also kind of like helps everyone and everyone likes him. He although. does. People love Ferris Bueller. Right. When they hear that he's like slightly sick, the entire town bands together <laughs> to try and right. save him. Well, you've also got Jeannie, the sister, uh, played by Jennifer Grey from Dirty Dancing. Yeah, and she she and Cameron are kind of in the same. She's kind of an overlap of like Cameron and then also Edward Rooney to where. She kind of it resents how much freedom he, he gets, and she because everything is harder for her mm-hmm. in her eyes, at least. Right. Um, and then Sloan, Ferris's girlfriend, who's just sort of along for the ride. Right. Because there needed to be a girl, and she's right. cute. And she's cute. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I there's an internet theory that I wanted to float to you guys. Um, which is that Ferris Bueller, and it doesn't work. It's not a good theory, but it's like, <laughs> um, what if Ferris Bueller was really Cameron's, like, Tyler Durden? Right. So imaginary, yeah. Imaginary and, like, it, the, the embodiment of everything he wants to be but isn't, mm. but could be. Well, yeah, it, it's, um, I'm sure it doesn't hold up. But, it does not. Everybody but, talks but to Ferris from a, Bueller. <laughs> but from a story point of view, that's the function of e- the, these characters mm-hmm. is that um, they're supposed to to put all that – they're supposed to be the thing that is attracted to them but also aggravates them. Mm-hmm. You know, And at the same time, Cameron also makes Ferris slow down and realize that he hurts people and that there's consequences and that he needs to – care about people Mm -hmm. you know towards the end it's not really a big moment in fact the biggest transformation is really more cameron it is it's sort of Mm -hmm. it's more his story yeah even though it's about ferris right ferris is kind of like mary poppins to where yeah it's more about the people he changes around him by being a straight up douche canoe right yeah (laughs) yeah it's like it's very forced like He's going to force Cameron to get out of the house and have this day off. But I, I do agree. Every mm-hmm. once in a while, you got to take a mental health day. But, like, that's what we, there would not be all these machinations. Is that the way you say that word? Mm hmm. Is it? <laughs> okay, good. To, to take a day off. Like, I feel like these days, 
you know, when you were in high school, Daniel, could you just be like, I need a day, mom? Uh, definitely not. No? no. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, me neither. No. It, it was definitely much easier in high school to miss school. Like, my hmm. school had a policy where if you missed 10 class periods or, like, 10 of one class period, then you would have to retake that class. Mm-hmm. Or you have the potential to retake that class, and they put it in front of, like, a board of people to decide your fate. So that's almost what Ferris Bueller's at, right? Because he's missed nine days? Yes, but he would have to redo the entire school year. In mm-hmm. ours, you would just miss that... One class. That one class. Well, but theoretically, if you missed the whole day, wouldn't that be applied to all your classes across the board? That's true, but the goal was to map it out so you would take a bunch of half days. Oh, okay. Because in theory, you could take... What, eighteen 20, half days? Yeah, half yeah. days. Hmm. Hmm. But I, like, I like sometimes you need to take a day off. I just like I don't feel like in this day and age you would need to do a bunch of lying to accomplish it. And they do so. He does so much work to achieve this day off. <laughs> right. He the, the rigs the whole setup in his room with the sickness and the dummy that rolls. Mm-hmm. He changes his family's outgoing message on their doorbell. He changes Sloane's outgoing message. He changes Cameron's outgoing message to be a funeral parlor. Mm-hmm. And then there's several other like things that they've already set up throughout the day to mm-hmm. get away with stuff. That's so much work. Yeah. <laughs> Just go to school. <laughs> I I feel I definitely feel like you know, so one of the one of the the things about this is trying to figure out how he could actually accomplish all this stuff in one day, yeah. and and I definitely feel like all those machinations since he's already missed like n- just nine days this year, that this those quarter. are in, yeah, it's th- this like that those are totally chunk. in place. Like he's got all those things ready to go, mm. and it's just kind of like boom, 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 boom. Yeah, and you definitely get the sense that Ferris just loves creating these complex systems and and um you know uh, and all these different things and scheming Mm -hmm. and and just sort of envisioning like how to pull thing pull things off like a bank robber almost you know yeah Yeah. i did want to ask you guys what you think happens to everybody after like in their (laughs) future and i think i think a high-tech bank robber would be like he's He's the face man of some kind mm-hmm. of crew of. Right. I think, yeah, I'd almost say like he would. He would be kind of almost like um, Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can, right? Yeah. You know, to where mm-hmm. it, it, it's more of the thrill of pulling things. Like he would be more the the guy on the FBI side who would mm-hmm. kind of come in late and be brilliant and tell everyone how the the the, the bank robber pulled things off because he's thought about it himself. Yeah. You know mm-hmm. that that's my that'd be my thing. Did you have a favorite part, Daniel? Oh, that's a good question. Or, or a least favorite part? I'm sure I did. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I. It was a watching the movie was a weird experience for me because my most significant uh, interaction with Matthew Broderick is him in Deck the Halls with Danny DeVito, which is a Christmas mm-hmm. movie where he's an uptight dad, oh, <laughs> and getting yes. that image out of my head watching him be the rambunctious scamp that ferris is was very strange that's how he started out for us <laughs> as a lovable scamp right, right. And now he's just a father yeah uh, but i really enjoyed um i liked when they were sneaking around past the their past ferris's father into mm-hmm. the cab because i thought how ridiculous it was that not only did ferris's father not see them sneaking into the cab but the people that ferris's father was with watching them sneak into the cab didn't say anything about it yeah and then later when he sees Sloane in the taxi, why doesn't he recognize his son's girlfriend? Right. That, that's so good. That's such a great scene. <laughs> John Hughes is so good at giving all these characters little moments, even if they're just barely on screen. The, oh, they're the so secretary. memorable. Yeah, the secretary, mm-hmm. so good. She gets all the best lines yeah, of the uh, yeah, movie. Absolutely. Oh, uh, Ed, with your back, you shouldn't throw anyone. Like, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> they think he's a righteous dude. Like, that is the line She's of the She's so good. Yeah. But, like, even just, like, the small characters, like, when, when we, like, all the different versions of these terrible, mind-numbing teachers... Oh yeah. my god, I love them so much. This is the first yeah. time I ever like experienced Ben Stein. Mm-hmm. And I think this is probably his iconic role, right? Yeah. He's the teacher who like in the very deadpan voice is like Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Mm-hmm. 
He like what else did he do? Like he had a game show in the nineties. Did right. you ever Win see that? Win Ben Stein's money. You've never seen I've it. I've never seen it. No. Oh. You well, should I, see it. I think his, his background was originally in politics. Ah. Oh. Perhaps we should have looked into. That. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the other teacher. Like so, Ben Stein's thing is that he's like. Does anyone, this was the blank, anyone, anyone, no, it was the this, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And then they show, and the kids are just like <laughs> melting. S- yeah. Struggling to stay awake. And then the English teacher that they show, it's just a slow talker. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what is the effect <laughs> Oh, just so much like gravity. Irony, on... yes. yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, do I think teachers didn't try as hard in the eighties? Like now, you got, you know, people. I feel like they make an effort to be more Miss Frizzle like. No. Yeah, maybe I definitely had a couple teachers that were there uh, because they didn't weren't able to get another job elsewhere and like didn't have teaching licenses and just. <laughs> Like they top. didn't have teaching. I'm like- sure they did. It didn't feel like they did, though. <laughs> I've definitely had teachers that uh, were similar to those depicted in in uh, what was the high school called? Was there a name for it? I'm sure that there. It was. Wouldn't it be? It's the same high school from the Breakfast Club. It's in Shermer, <sighs> Illinois. Right. Yeah. We're so fa- we're so failing on this one. Uh, they even mention it in Ready Player One. Yes. Yeah, it's like the famous John Hughes High School. That's what we'll call it for now. Okay. Famous John Hughes High School. I feel like it's like Shermer High or something, right? Moving on. (laughs) Um, I could look it up, but I'm not going to. Um, So, yeah, John Hughes gives, you know, all these little characters these great moments, even like the students that we cut to um, that are just struggling to stay awake. All of them have these great personalities when they're responding like, oh, no, Ferris Bueller, he's, you know, I heard from my friends that my uncle's cousin, this, this, and that. And there's just so much life and energy and and uh, personality to these mm-hmm. characters. I, and the spe- there's a part where, like, Ferris is still at home, and he calls the school's hallway payphone <laughs> to just right. talk to anyone who's walking by. And I think, yeah. like, that's probably, like, the extreme extroversion of Ferris Bueller is, like, just put hand me to someone else and I will talk to that person right. about whatever. And, you know, it just, like, gives him power to lie to people and manipulate them. But he's, like, in particular, the most awful to specifically Cameron. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In that way that, like, you know... And I feel like this is a very 80s concept as well, although it did pepper itself into the 90s quite a bit, which is like, no means maybe. Like, someone saying they don't want to do something means you push harder. Well, he also needs something from Cameron. He does. Most of these people, he doesn't need anything except their attention. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he so so Ferris doesn't have a car, and so he needs Cameron's car. Mm -hmm. Um. And there is this part that he wants Cameron along for the ride. He wants him to be his Robin to his Batman. Yes. He wants him to have fun and, like, shake it off a little bit or, like, Mm -hmm. you know, not be quite so... Heavy. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite so serious all the time. Why so serious, Cameron Fry? What did you think of Cameron? I, I well, as somebody who has who is just anxious all the time, <laughs> I felt horribly for him the entire. <laughs> you, uh, it I made me him. so anxious and depressed. <laughs> yeah, definitely. He he also like stopped being sick halfway through the longest day ever. Uh huh. He was very sick in the morning, then he was just no longer sick. But I I did enjoy Cameron. I thought he was the best out of all of them. And then when he destroyed his father's car, mm-hmm. I was really bummed. That no one stopped him from doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, it's like the miles you can get away with, but then mm-hmm. it just went downhill from there. Sending yeah. it out of a window, yeah, maybe a little more noticeable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they he, he so they they steal their they, his dad's car, and we realize the very fancy Ferrari that the dad doesn't even drive. He just wipes it with a diaper. Yeah, it only has like a hundred and thirty yeah. miles on it, yep. and three quarters. halfway between three and four. Yeah, right. Um, and he's just so anxious about it all the time. And we realize the source 
of his anxiousness and depression is his relationship with his parents, particularly with his dad. And 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 John Hughes really kind of takes that that need to throw off that 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 you know those shackles to the furthest degree. Mm-hmm. First, we think it's just going to be him denting and 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 punching and kicking his dad's car, mm-hmm. but then the <laughs> you know it fl- the car flies out the window. Because they were rolling it in reverse to take off the miles. Which, like, <laughs> come on. Nobody thought that was going to work. Yeah. No. And, and and the whole car smashes out the window and gets destroyed. And so that's a great example from a storytelling point of view of taking that to the furthest that it could go. The, heightening it. Yeah. They're heightening it to the, the end of the line. Of, right. It's not just the miles. It's not just a dent. He's utterly destroyed the car. Mm-hmm. And now he has to have a showdown with his dad. Yes, he has to have his his moment with his dad. So what do you think happens to Cameron in the future? Do you think Ferris, Ferris's prediction comes true? Well, I don't... Was Ferris's prediction that his father would be fine with it? No, that, he would, that Cameron would marry uh, the first girl that he... Oh sleeps with and then she would be horrible to him for that's the rest right. of his life that's the worry right that's mm-hmm. the worry that well that might be the case <laughs> maybe <laughs> but i feel like cameron's smart and he can figure it out i don't think his relationship with his father is going to become like transformative after this mm-hmm. i don't think his father's gonna be like you know what you're right i do love you yeah i don't yeah. think that's the case i, I think it'll be a clean break yeah, yeah. i think it, it's the thing that 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 Cameron needs is to go away, mm-hmm. to go to college, and to basically start new. Yeah. You know, yeah. But like to to hopefully take a little bit of that Ferris. Like there, you need a happy medium between Ferris Bueller and Cameron Fry, right? Yeah. Someone who does want to stop and look around every once in a while and appreciate the smaller things in life and live in the moment, but mm-hmm. like not be an asshole. Yeah, I, right. and I feel like that character is might be his sister. At the end of the movie, yes, you're right mm-hmm. because, and I and I really like. I have a problem with Jeannie, the character of the sister, because she's just like philosophically, her feeling is like, why should he have anything at all that I don't have? You know, right. why should he get away with it? She is like the proto Phineas and Ferb sister, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, she's always trying to bust Ferris. But but just because she feels like he shouldn't get away with it, mm-hmm. why should he get to blah blah blah? Well, it's like you could too. Like no one would mm-hmm. stop you from doing these things or being nice to people. She is a stone cold B to everybody that she even like encounters in passing. Mm-hmm. She's just like walks in with an attitude of meanness. What do you think about that? Yes, I, I completely agree with you, and. Um... Well, she wasn't, was she mean to Charlie Sheen, which that didn't age very well. Oh my gosh, yes. At the police station, yeah. the only other person in the lobby is Charlie Sheen, who's like just playing himself. Yeah. Like that's the most such real we're ever going to see Charlie Sheen. It is such a good scene, though I love the way that it's written. I like the way that it's paced. Like when, because he's, she sits down and he goes, drugs. Right. She goes, no, thank you. <laughs> no, are you here for drugs? No, what are you here for? Drugs. Drugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, she does try to, to sort of play her mean game mm-hmm. with Charlie Sheen. And it bounces and off. Yeah, he's just not having it. Right. Um, although I do hate his character for sort of being like, you wear too much makeup and like, why don't you just chill out? But he's right. Right. Yeah. What, but why do you think that she like immediately responds to him? Because I sort of am like, okay, movie, why are you, are you trying to tell me that all she needed was... Someone to challenge her, mm-hmm. I think. You okay. know, that's the thing. It's it, it was she needed kind of a brick to be thrown through her plate glass window. Mm-hmm. You know, she needed someone that wasn't part of her normal ecosphere to basically challenge her and to call her on her bullshit. Because she immediately devolves into like a giggling. Right. Mm-hmm. Was it like a bad boy sort of complex where she's like, oh, I need. A yeah, real man. I, 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 they're not going to work out at all, but she needed someone to kind of break her out of herself, you know? And and we we kind of see how in, in that great reveal, we see, so so Edward Rooney, the principal... Loses yeah. his mind! Yeah, he just, 
he in the same so he is affronted by um by uh Ferris Bueller as just like some of these other characters and he is going to take him to task. He makes it very clearly that that you know he controls this um this school and he is going to ruin Ferris Bueller. He is going to ruin him by making then, him repeat one year of one high school. Year, by keeping him there. Like, right. I'm going to ruin your life by keeping you with me as much as possible. Which is the same thing the principal does in Breakfast Club. Mm-hmm. It's like, I hate you specifically, so I'm going to make it so we spend the most time together instead of just, like, ignoring you. Right. Is that the principal from Breakfast Club? It's or is not he the like same the, actor. Yeah. No, no. Is he, like, the vice principal? Or oh, you're right. If it's the same I would love school. it if they if it's still the same high school and they both work together. They're co-principals? Yeah. Well, <laughs> if, if one's a vice principal and one's a principal, like, if they still are there at the school at the same time, I'd yeah. love that. Right. Well, that would mean that the principal from Breakfast Club has, this, like, also has access to that wonderful secretary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that would lighten him up, I feel. Yeah, but he, like, he loses his damn mind and, and just, like, decides all of a sudden that he's going to he's gonna f- destroy Ferris Bueller at all costs. Yeah, and it keeps in it devolving. To, into breaking into their house. Right. That's madness. Mm-hmm. Like, what does he do once he gets there? He reports him, and then he's... A, 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 I don't know, a, a criminal, I yeah. guess, at that point. How did you know, Principal Rooney? Well, I broke into the family home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so in this great reveal, because we, we, we think that the principal's been dealt with, he's been attacked by their vicious dog, which they it, apparently the own. The Buellers have a vicious dog, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he's humiliated, and it's, it seems like the... The big threat to Ferris Bueller is just getting home in time before his parents arrive. Right. And we've totally, at this point, written um, Edward Rooney off. Mm-hmm. And then he, he's he got this great surprise moment at the end where he's there to catch Ferris just as he's sneaking back in. Mm-hmm. And then so the sister has kind of come around and she's gone through her own transformation and... and before her at the beginning of the movie, she would have totally let Rooney bust him. Yeah, and been standing over his shoulder right. going, in your face! But she, thanks to Charlie Sheen, <laughs> <laughs> she's lightened up and um, she's less about what, you know, so she helps out Ferris. Which, like, she's racing home. They, there's a, like, the, 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 one of my favorite parts in the movie is the Ferris running. Mm-hmm. Like, the little running sequence where he's leaping over fences and mm-hmm. running through yards. Yeah. But, okay, here's another thought that occurred to me. So this is the end of the school year. So that would make it, what, April? May? We know it's a school day. Mm-hmm. And yet there's a parade. <laughs> <laughs> And, like, people in their yards having picnics and, like, pool parties. Right. Is there some sort of, um... I suppose, that was a... Some sort of weekday holiday? That... <laughs> some sort of, like, spring break? No. But if not, or they would be out of school, like... Well, it depends on what different... I guess back then, maybe... Because now you have... It's like, oh, we're taking our spring break during this week, and mm-hmm. then someone else is... But because uh, yeah. they yeah they could have done all of this in in a day that was not a school day. Mm-hmm. When he was running home, it was six o'clock at night, but which that, might that's could be what a I lot of homeschooled like, children. <laughs> but it couldn't possibly have been six o'clock at night. I thought he looked at the watch and said, "Oh, it's almost six And like, yeah, he has to get home. He has to get home at six. Okay. So then, all of this stuff with Principal Rooney is happening after the school day is over. So what time does school get out? Like three? Where are they at? at like three. So they're at the baseball game at noon. <laughs> like I want to track this right. fucking timeline <laughs> and see like, because, unless they spend only five minutes every place they go. Because the first place they go is the Sears Tower. Yeah. The second place they go is the Stock Exchange. Then they go to the fancy lunch, right? Oh no, it's noon at the fancy lunch. Right. Then they go to the baseball game. Yes. Then they go to the museum. Then they go to the parade. Also, are they paying admission at all of these places? Because that's an expensive day out. It is an expensive. It is. Did they get a city pass? Right. Is he charming his way 
through the doors. He also had to convince Cameron to come with him, get the car, and spend time by the pool all in the morning before he even left for his activities. That's right. All right, so one website tried to break it down. Okay. All right. And he was, he was shocked and surprised that it is potentially possible. Okay, so here we go. So this is uh, OMG Facts. Um, rise and shine. So getting up, um, uh, he, he said uh, it's possible that uh, school started at 7.30. His own high school started at 7.30. Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time, let's see. God, that's so early. Is that what time school started when you went to high school? 7.45. Oof, that's... Yeah. That's per- that's not that's wrong. Okay, so downtown nine thirty. Um, let's see, or is, or is the times underneath? Let's see, rise and shine. Okay, so downtown seven thirty. Okay, so Sears Tower. Um, the walk from the garage to the tower is roughly six minutes. So if they spend fifteen minutes there, then they're eventually out at eleven. Chicago Board of Trade is just a five minute walk. Uh, then lunch. If that's an hour, hour and a half, they're at Wrigley Field at one o'clock. If they stay there for two hours, then they're out at three. Um, they're most which is likely, the end of the school day. Yeah. So, um, and then a half hour at the Art Institute, um, and then but eventually, you can't see everything that's there in half an hour. Well, no, they obviously didn't spend the whole time there. It was for some of these. It's basically they got to be super quick. The parade, probably 30, 45 minutes, you know, with traffic. Um, Cameron's meltdown, an hour 15. And so somewhere in the the 6 o'clock, so the 5.50 to 6.30 zone, he's running home. Okay. I assumed it was much earlier in the afternoon. Um, But... uh, I mean, you're not really stopping to look around if you're going. If you're like, we're going to stop and look around at 15 places where we will spend approximately five minutes each. Right. Yeah. There's there's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of taxis. Yeah. You're really just kind of spending short little bursts. Mm-hmm. And but I did I do love I think I think other than the running home, my favorite part might be the museum sequence. Yeah. Especially that part where Cameron's like just looking at the screaming child in Sunday at the Park. And <laughs> mm-hmm. it's just like Cameron's face, painting face, Cameron's face, painting face, Cameron's face, painting face. And he just like, what a good performance yeah. by Alan Ruck. Anyway, so he's running home. Jeannie almost crashes him to him with the car. And then she starts driving completely insane and erratic, we think, trying to get home to bust him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when did her change of heart happen? Maybe she hasn't decided at this point. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would say the the change would be seeing him in peril with Edward Rooney. Like maybe she wants to bust him. She hasn't even decided yet. Mm-hmm. And when she sees him threatening and being kind of a bully and a, and a villain to him, that's the moment that she twists and changes. Yeah, because she doesn't rec- seem to recognize him when she kicks him right in the face. Right. And and so maybe it's at that moment she realizes he was the one in the house, too. Yeah. There's only one person more evil than me, and it is you. <laughs> so I will change my mind. Um, can you think of any movies, Daniel, that you would compare this to, like, that you really love? Or any characters that, like... Uh, I... I I just finished watching Sex Education recently, which mm-hmm. is a TV show on Netflix. Mm-hmm. It's also like a teen, like, find my way in the world sort of show. Yeah. And I thought that those were fairly similar with regard to, I don't know, the teenage experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How many sociopaths are in it? Not many. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, the, the idea of, like, trying to, like, figure out who you are and that sort of thing that makes the those teen movies, like, gives them their their clout, so to speak, I mm-hmm. think, mm-hmm. is evident in both of those. So what in this movie felt uh, dated or very 80s to you? Uh, the first time I saw Ferris with a phone, yeah, uh-huh. um, that's when I was like, oh, yeah, that's, this is not current. Um, you couldn't, yeah, you couldn't get away with any of this in the land no. of cell phones Mm-mm. and camera phones and mm-hmm. pictures. I'm sure there's a way, but it'd be different. Yeah. Yeah, it would 100% have to be totally different because you couldn't get away with the mannequin in the bed. You couldn't get away with the, you know, doorbell thing, changing the outgoing messages. 
right? Because it would just say the number you were calling on your phone. Also, like, theoretically, Cameron's parents would have, like, a low jack on the car, right? And there would be an alarm that would be like, the car is leaving the garage. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. But they could also just very easily write in, like, oh, I'm smart and I made an app. And then, like... Could you... So, that, like, we kind of talked a little bit about that. Like, if they were to remake this, they would have to rethink it so completely... Mm -hmm. But do you think it could well, be done? I, Would it still be an interesting story? I, I, I think if they remade it, or if, let's say, if Ferris Bueller had never existed, it was just a script, and you were adapting it and creating it for now, I honestly don't think there'd be a ton that they'd have to change. Just sort of the machinations of, of how they pull off. Like It's like, okay, we need a moment where the principal tries to call the mom. Mm-hmm. you know, And then how do they pull off that misdirect we need a moment where the principal comes to the house and tries to interact. And, and I think just some of the details of how those things get pulled off would just be different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think all the steps of, of um, them going about, them stealing the dad's car, them pulling off the misdirection, I think all that could stay the same. Okay. You know, just the details of like maybe Rooney is, is talking to... You know, some like um, <laughs> maybe there's like a, a a fake video or or some sort of like uh, like he's hacked the ring doorbell. To- yeah, he, like there's a like a little um, camera or like a video conference thing mm-hmm. there that's hacked. I think um, the the parents still like you know um, fake like maybe there'd be some app on his phone to where someone would come in and he'd be able to to talk to them or be able to. Um, to do that, I yeah, I, I think a lot of it would be the same. Okay, it's just the technology would be different. Who would you see as like today's Ferris Bueller? Because I I feel like we get so much of that character these days because of Ferris Bueller. Mm-hmm. Because everybody loved Ferris Bueller and wanted to mm-hmm. be like Ferris Bueller. We have a lot of people who that's sort of their persona, mm-hmm. right? The like lovable trickster scamp. I, I think, it, and he's, it, I, it's got to be a younger Ryan Reynolds. And I yeah. think that was definitely like, you know, played for fun in in the Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. I did think immediately of Deadpool in that scene where he's walking around in his bathrobe. Yeah. I'm not really aware of any actors that are under 30 or 25. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Having no children and not seeing like younger programming. Like, I, I don't know anyone who's who's young. Daniel, so, you're young. Oh boy, what, what, what do young people like these days? Yeah, I'm I'm young, but like, I'm trying to think of what I know. Like, I just watched. What did I watch? I watched The Devil Wears Prada. There's nothing in there that there's <laughs> there's no young men in Devil Wears Prada. No. What what other movies might not be <laughs> well, applicable? Might not work here. <laughs> um, no, there's Tom Holland, who's the young Spider Man, right? He's, I, yeah, he's very sincere, though. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe is Cameron. He's very earnest. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, he would be a great Cameron. But I feel like Cameron can't be, like, a stone-cold hottie. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be an everyman quality. <laughs> okay. okay. What if we, like, I would love to see, like, maybe a gender flop. I mean, yeah. Ferris is not inherently masculine. Like, maybe it's Zendaya. Right. Although she's kind of like... We're just picking out the cast from Spider-Man Homecoming. We are. Now. We are doing that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. I really like Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> um, but I think that could be it, an interesting It's interesting that we bring that... about women, you know. Yeah. We, it's interesting we bring that up because they definitely cited uh, John Hughes as a inspiration for that movie, Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think John Hughes movies, like, had a huge forever impact on like people my age like that's what you wanted high school to be like when you were younger mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. high school age it, it felt like just like an extreme version of your but it's slightly more well written than your version of high school like exactly the the things that were stressful and dangerous you know about like the social environment that felt you you were connected to that mm-hmm. you know and, and then like the different like groups that had power and you wanted to be involved into or or things like that like that felt like the politics and like the social structure of your world 
Um, so what did you feel like were um, the aspects of a John Hughes movie that you liked or you noticed? Uh, definitely the... Um, so from, from Breakfast Club, when I watched that... I didn't think that the women were treated very well in that movie. Mm-hmm. And then, so I was con- concerned going into Ferris Bueller that women were going to be treated well. It's not that they were treated poorly, they just they didn't have any character. Right. Like, the women didn't really do much in those. They were either a girlfriend or a bitch. Right. Right. Or, like, or a secretary. Exactly. <laughs> the three. Uh, but the I thought the the dialogue was really well written and it never felt weird or awkward or uncomfortable or anything like that so the the dialogue was something that i really appreciated and enjoyed what did you think about the fact that there was never a fourth wall like he starts out addressing us specifically right right mm-hmm. that was that, that's the kind of thing where if i think about it too much i start to get really uncomfortable with it mm. and then that like like i start to be like well that doesn't make any sense but i thought it was done well and like the mm-hmm. execution was really strong with and, and I don't think it was, like, too much or too little either. Yeah. Because I feel like... He's sort it, of explaining to us, like, here's how you get out of being sick. And for a while, they put actual words on the screen. Yeah. Like, the clammy hands, mm-hmm. fake... I, and then they totally drop that. Yeah. I feel like the, maybe there would have been other opportunities to right. use that. Hmm. But that sort of fourth wall breaking... It works so seamlessly. It yeah. does. Because it, it starts out the gate that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and that's not really a John Hughes trope. No, no, no. I, I don't think he does that in any of his other movies. Nope. But Deadpool does it. Deadpool. Right. De- Deadpool is like, what if Ferris Bueller really was a, a murderer? <laughs> because, yeah. If Ferris Bueller had superpowers. Yeah. Well, and like, that's the thing is. The, Ferris Bueller is the type of character who could so easily become just a murderer because he could get away yeah. with it. <laughs> right. Because like he is a sociopath, he has no fear and no regard for like how he's impacting other people. So like in a in a different <laughs> world, mm-hmm. he is a murderer. He is Ted Bundy, right? Um, but I do think one thing that doesn't hold up very well about these movies to me that you wouldn't see in a modern remake of this is that there are no people of color in this world. Yeah, very few that that have any significance. Yeah, role. they're like the people who work at the garage, and they're not the people who are like in the high school. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's interesting seeing um, multiple John Hughes movies to kind of see okay, what was his background? Because you see these re um, reappearing characters and settings, mm-hmm. you know. So um, white men, uh, upper cl- upper class, yeah. or upper middle class, mm-hmm. even you know. And that that just it was the perspective that he's bringing to it, right? Um, f- for a lot of these movies, um, and you know, it it almost feels like the same house over and over again, right? Yeah, which like is the McAllister house. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very much that. Have you ever seen any of those things that are like the McAllister house would actually be like a forty million dollar mansion, <laughs> mm-hmm. like the property yeah. value of it or whatever. Um, but but even even so even so that is a as a negative or as a neutral. But even then, like everyone is unhappy and trying to find their place in the world, and and they're relatable. It's not like it's upstairs downstairs. Uh-huh. It's like they're still ultimately people struggling to um, come to terms with the things that define them with their parents yeah. and and the kind of the stuff uh, and trying to find themselves. Is the theme of, like, kids versus parents not as much of a thing now as it was in the 80s? Yeah, did we solve that problem? Did we solve that problem, <laughs> I don't know if the problem was solved. I just don't think it's talked about as, as much. much? Any, because I feel like a lot of the conflict comes from, like, like peers now. Like, in the mm-hmm. movie Booksmart. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's how the other kids treat you. Right. And they have great relationships with their parents. Mm-hmm. Well, because that's us. We're those parents. They, yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Like, and so we're like, I'm not going to do what my dad did and love my car and my job more than you. I love you too much. Right. Yeah. It, it, the helicopter parents, The it's, it's very much like we're going to be the generation that gets it right. We're going to be the ones that, that straighten it out and are caring, protective, supportive 
Yes. We've got medals and trophies for every event. For everybody. We're not putting this insane pressure on you <laughs> to like achieve or whatever. Right. Like, what's the line from Breakfast Club where, where Emilio Estevez is like, his dad is just yelling at him and he has to win, 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 and nothing else matters? Like, I feel like that's Cameron's dad, right. too. Like, their kids are their, a reflection of themselves mm-hmm. in an achievement way. Yeah. And now you're just all awful to each other. Is that what I'm right. understanding, Daniel? I think, I think that's what I understand. <laughs> yeah. Is that we're just terrible people yeah. to each other, but we love our moms. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That's right. all I care about. <laughs> I will be honest with you. Right. As the mother of an eighth grader, that's all I care about. Does she love me? Right. <laughs> like, right. I don't care how the other kids <laughs> treat her. No, that's not true. I do care very much. Just not as much. Social media, <laughs> man. You guys... You have it rough. It's scary. Yeah. Was that a thing when you were in high school? Like, did, like, in, did the Instagram and the Facebooks and stuff, like, how did oh, that work in your social hierarchy? Definitely. Well, I kind of, we grew up with it. Yeah. So it was, um, I was, I had a phone, I got a phone when I was in third grade. No, uh, yeah. third grade? Yeah. And I My son's in fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't thought about it a lot since, I've never thought about it. And it's because my brother was going into middle school Mm -hmm. like seventh grade and my mom didn't know how to like deal with that so so she just so she got me a phone too but none of my friends had phones Mm -hmm. so I missed sort of the excitement of oh I have a phone now I can like share things with people right it was a flip phone so it wasn't like a super fancy one yeah so by the time all my friends had phones I was like "Ah, that's old news so I never like posted recklessly or anything on social media but I definitely have friends who have and who have gone through and like purged their middle school posts and that sort of thing but that was that's something that like we assume that everybody has and you can't really like bully people for it because everybody has that embarrassing middle school yes except mine are all written down on paper in journals (laughs) that i can burn in fire right right. um yeah my embarrassing middle school self has been erased from the it's not a permanent record of anything Mm -hmm. um oh i should let you know that in 1986 um so I like to give the box office numbers and okay. information of the movies, and then uh, I'll be interested to know what other movies in the top ten that you have have perhaps seen. Okay. Uh, but in 1986, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was number ten, seventy million. Wow. Seventy million, and that was number ten. Can you believe it? Wow. That's like I feel like Avengers made seventy million before it opened. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. adjusted for inflation. Adjusted for inflation. Um, number one, Top Gun. Have you seen it? I have not. Tom Cruise is in it. That's I true. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Crocodile Dundee. I've heard of it. Platoon. I've heard of it. Karate Kid Part 2. I've definitely seen the first Karate Kid. I think I've seen Karate Kid Part 2. Star Trek for The Voyage Home. I have not seen Star Trek for The Voyage Home. Back to School. No, haven't heard, even heard of that one. Aliens. Is that with Sigourney Weaver? It is. I have not seen it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Golden Child with Eddie Murphy. I, no, I have not seen it. Uh, it's for the best. <laughs> oh, you don't like it? I love it. And Ruthless People. No, I have not seen that either. Okay. Stand By Me? Was that with the... Oh, no. I was, that, I'm thinking of Homeward Bound with the dogs. Stand the by very me. different movies. Right. Is, Unless, do the dogs find a dead body in Homeward Bound? No, they just go home. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's the top ten yes. of, uh, of 1986. Okay. So on a scale of ten. On a scale of ten Ferraris. From mm. one Ferrari to ten Ferraris. <laughs> how many Ferraris do you give... Ferris Bueller, stay off. And I, w- I want to start with Nathan because you're like always very analytical. Um, I'm going to give it an 8.5. Really? Yeah. I, because That's I th- high praise from Nathan Blackwell. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, you know, um, I, I just think the storytelling is so good and the, the character work is so good. Mm-hmm. Um, say what you will about Ferris. You know, I personally think that some of his flaws were in part intentional. Like yeah. you're not supposed to love him at all moments. He's mm-hmm. supposed to be a scamp. Um at sometimes he burns your fingers and sometimes he he you know opens new doors for you, yeah. you know. And I think it doesn't go without commentary. Like I think mm-hmm. Cameron calls him on his shit. Mm-hmm. Um and so I I just think that um John Hughes is just such a great writer and and a comedic director. Yeah. 
Uh, it's just great storytelling. It is. Yeah. And, like, he needs Cameron. Like, the camera's his anchor. Yeah. That keeps him in reality. I think they mentioned that be- they became friends in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. So, like, it has to have that, like, rooted in the childhood. Yeah, they both thing. need each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you think they stay friends into adulthood? I'd like to think so, yeah. I, I think that... Um, we need Adam Reaney to tell us what happened. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's the, the, uh, I, I think that they both need each other as those anchors. Maybe yeah. maybe they go off and do separate lives, but I do think that they kind of um, are like planetary bodies that need to kind of rotate around each other. Mm. Very good. One Ferrari to ten Ferraris, uh, Daniel. How many Ferraris? I'll give it seven Ferraris. Okay. Uh, That's a lot of Ferraris. Yeah, yes. I, enjoy, I, I liked it. I, I did. I don't think I'd watch it again all the way through by myself, but okay. I wouldn't do that with most movies. Okay. But I would, like, if someone's like, oh, let's watch a movie, and I was like, okay. I'm not explaining this well. If someone had never seen it before, I would watch it with them. Okay. But, so. but you're not going to be like, ugh, it's been a long day. I need some Ferris Bueller to, to cheer right. me up. Right. Okay, that's fair. Um, I think I will also give it, I'll give it seven and a half. I'll give it seven Ferraris because I do think it holds up better than a lot of the other John Hughes stories Mm -hmm. um, because it it is missing a lot of the sort of problematic elements that you'll get in a, in a 16 candles, let's Mm -hmm. say, or breakfast club as we discussed. Like, I think it's like fairly innocent and it's like storytelling and and what have you and i still think it's fun to watch and you know it makes me uh very nostalgic so uh, yeah i think i enjoyed it it flew by um i like ferris bueller Mm -hmm. he deserves a day off um what is your deep cut recommendation so mine is a a movie that i i deeply love uh rushmore Oh, yes. Oh, my God. What a good recommendation. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> and so another, so uh, Max Fisher um, is another kind of manipulative, uh, extroverted character, but in a very different Wes Anderson kind of way, yes. you know, uh, the, the um, uh, it's almost kind of like um, uh, the character in that played by Jason Schwartzman mm-hmm. is more of an, a prolific introvert rather than like just this this crazy extrovert to where he's inventing these worlds and he's getting other people to help enable him Mm -hmm. and kind of manipulating them through the kind of um the quest you know it's like we're gonna pull off this 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 big heist we're gonna pull off this you know this huge play (laughs) um you need to be a part of it yeah you know um, and, and yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities and, um, they're both really interesting, compelling characters. Yeah. That mm-hmm. is like, I think you win. That was great. <laughs> that was perfect. And I did not think of that at all. Um, have you seen Rushmore? I have not seen Rushmore. Oh my God. You should see Rushmore. So that's in the nineties. Okay. Yes. Are you, are you familiar with Wes Anderson? I am. Okay. Yes. I saw a Wes Anderson movie and it made me uncomfortable. I don't oh. remember which one it was though. <laughs> Okay. Were there talking dogs? Was no. it animated? It was the one where it was all like just a long pan. Well, that's that's most of them. <laughs> uh, maybe the Moonrise one Kingdom. Is that oh, what it okay. was? Yeah. That is a movie. It could have been that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, do you have a favorite movie? Uh, like ever that I've yeah. seen? Oh, probably. Mm, I'll get back to you on okay. it. Okay. Okay. Just, your, just text us. <laughs> yeah, I will. Deep cut recommendation. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, but I think probably Booksmart. Oh yeah. Because it's, I mean, it's still nice. a a teen high school movie. Mm-hmm. But I think it, where it succeeds is that it's it's two women care mm-hmm. like two females that are uh, the main characters. One of them's gay, and there's like people of color in it, and mm-hmm. it's still like a we're having a high school adventure sort of movie. Yeah. And I really like. And is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like two adult women playing high school characters, right? Or are they young people? They're young. They're like 
early 20s. Okay. So it's not like a Luke Perry situation. No. Okay. No. <laughs> um, I have like 25 deep cut recommendations. <laughs> I like could not. I was like, Phineas and Ferb is the perfect recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, you could easily recommend Fight Club for that same like, is Ferris Bueller his Tyler Durden? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I, I was like, almost like, oh, I'll recommend Deadwood because Principal Rooney is a character in, in Deadwood. But right. I think I'm going to go with Speed. Oh. <laughs> One of my very favorite movies <laughs> that has Keanu Reeves in it. Go on. Uh, because Alan Ruck plays a character. It's like adult Cameron who's on the bus. Oh, uh, yeah. Do you remember his character? Mm-hmm. No, I don't. But, I, yeah, I, no, I remember him from Star Trek. Uh, is it Star Trek 7? Mm, yeah. I don't know. I've never seen yeah, He plays Star the Trek captain Trek. of one of the new Enterprises. Oh. It's true. I remember him from nothing. It's like Ferris Bueller and Speed. Like, I'm okay. sure he's done other things. Mm-hmm. But his character in Speed is like, uh, at one point, Keanu Reeves is under the bus looking at the bomb. And he's on top with the phone mm-hmm. relaying the information to Dumb and Dumber. What's that guy's name? Jeff, Jeff Daniels. Daniels. Uh, good one, Daniel. Thank you. I've seen uh, one of these movies. <laughs> and uh, like Keanu Reeves is under the bus and he's like, oh, fuck me. And uh, Cameron is the phone goes, oh, darn. <laughs> like, it's just, it's the cutest. His character in that is like the best comic relief. Um, and everyone should see Speed anyway. And I think that's like, we have yet to mm-hmm. do a Keanu Reeves movie on this podcast. Wow. But I think I've recommended at least yeah. three. It's it's it, mm-hmm. he really didn't hit his his stride until the the early nineties. I the disagree. Issue. Was it Speed in the nineties? It was. It was nineteen ninety four. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. Awesome. So, uh, Daniel, where can people see you in your comedic performances? Uh, at uh, National Comedy Theater Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> that seemed manipulative of me, right. didn't it? I That's hope okay. that was the right answer to that question. It's charming. It was, oh, okay. yes, it was. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see Daniel and Chrissy together on stage at NCT Phoenix uh, Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, find out at nctphoenix.com where we will both be improvising. Mm-hmm. Make us do a scene about Ferris Bueller for you. Uh, Nathan, where can people find everything about you? Uh, Squishy Studios uh, uh, on all the social medias and Instagrams and Facebooks and Twitters. And of course, everything Most Excellent Pod can be found at mostexcellentpod.com including the episode post where we'll post links to all of our um, uh, deep cut recommendations and so on. Hey, give us a like. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Tell a friend. Tell a neighbor. Text someone about Most Excellent 80s Movies Podcast. We would appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Thank you for listening. When you're out there in the world, remember to be excellent to each other and party party on, on, dudes. dudes. And enjoy life while it lasts. Bueller. 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 I'll cut that part. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yay. We're done.